So chapter 5 was a very dense and complex chapter, but I'm sure that our guest expert will give us some clarification on the issue addressed in this chapter and show us some uh, concrete implications on the ground. Indeed, we have the pleasure to welcome Lieutenant Colonel Christian Lecoq, who is working for the Belgian Ministry of Defence and as a legal advisor to the Belgian Armed Forces, currently deployed in Syria. So thanks a lot to be here and to be part of this MOOC. It's a real pleasure to have you. And uh, so I would like to ask you some questions about the, the, the questions, the issue that you addressed in this chapter five. It's a big chapter on the conduct of hostility. So I will start with uh, that question. Uh, what are, in your opinion, the, the main uh, principles regulating the conduct of hostilities which involve significant constraints on the, on the military operations of state armed forces? Well, in relation to the main principles that guide the conduct of hostilities, I would say that there are three main principles which guide the armed forces whenever they conduct attacks within the framework of an armed conflict. Um, and the three main principles are the principle of distinction, principle of precautions in attack, and the principle of proportionality. To what extent those principles are a constraint in the conduct of facilities is a different question. Um, I'm not convinced that those principles, by definition, are necessarily constraints. It all depends on the operational environment in which you have to apply these uh, different principles. For example, the principles of distinction, precautions and proportionality, uh, as far as symmetric uh, warfare is concerned against an enemy that complies with its obligations under the law of war, I don't see very much constraints in the operationalizing in operationalizing these principles, uh, since the enemy will uh, wear a distinctive sign, will wear its uniform, will not intermingle with the civilian population, will not use civilians as a human shield. In other words, there is no need, in fact, to find additional ways uh, in which we need to distinguish uh, with more precautions uh, how to distinguish between innocent civilians on the one hand and enemy combatants or civilians who are directly participating in hostilities otherwise. So the issue of the principles um, is very easy. Um, those are the three main principles, distinguish at all times between enemy combatants and civilians on the one hand, and as far as objects are concerned, between civilian objects and military objectives. Now once you have a tick in the box in relation to the principle of distinction, which we generally refer to as the principle of PID, positive identification, that is to say the reasonable certainty that a given uh, geospatially located object or person is a legitimate, uh, legitimate military objective in accordance with the law of armed conflict, well then comes into play the second principle, with the, which is the principle of precautions. Uh, namely, belligerent parties have to do whatever is feasible in order to minimize uh, and to the maximum extent possible to avoid collateral damage to the civilian population and the civilians and only to the extent that you took all precautionary measures in order to avoid or minimize those collateral uh, damages, uh, then comes into play the, the, the principle of proportionality. To what extent uh, the collateral damage that is expected uh, from an attack would be excessive or not in relation to the anticipated military advantage of an attack. So I wouldn't consider those principles as being a constraint by definition. It all depends on the operational uh, environment in which you have to apply those principles. That will be but a the, precisely issue. in Syria, because it's a legal advisor to the forces in Syria, are they, are they acting as a constraint, a really big constraint for, for the decision of... I, I don't know if it's a constraint, it's definitely an obstacle. It's an additional obstacle in relation to the, the usual work you have to do in order to find the, 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 the necessary intelligence in order to make sure that your uh, military objective is a legitimate military objective, that you took all the precautionary measures and that it is not excessive, at least your collateral damage. And that's, of course, uh, a different ball game than what we had in the past, for example, if we compare that to the, the war, uh, the armed conflict in Libya, where we were facing basically a state armed force uh, mm -hmm. using um, the normal techniques. Whenever you're facing in an asymmetric warfare, counter-terrorism operations, counter-insurgency operations, when you basically face an enemy that is uh, basically disregarding all its obligations under the law of armed conflict by not wearing a uniform, by using civilians as uh, human shields, then of course it becomes very difficult or more difficult uh, to identify who is the enemy, who can I target in armed conflict. And there are different ways in which we can uh, at least uh, try to uh, identify more accurately uh, those enemy fighters, if I may say so, because they don't comply with the, 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 the definition of a combatant. And one of those elements is, for example, to have more restrictive rules of engagement. 
Um, you could, for example, um, limit uh, offensive force um, to basically uh, persons or groups who commit a hostile act or demonstrate a hostile intent against a force or against persons who are designated with a special status. So basically what you do is basically restraining yourself even more than what the law of armed conflict allows you to do in order to comply with all your obligations mm -hmm. and to avoid that civilians would be the target, would be the uh, unnecessary victims uh, of the armed conflict. Thanks. Thanks for this, this answer. So I think you, you partly answered the, the second question I wanted to ask you is the problem of identifying uh, civilians in, in non-international conflict and international conflict. But as you said, in non-international conflict it's quite really difficult. Uh, what are the, the, the criteria that, that are used and uh, what's, your, what's uh, your opinion on, this, on these problems? Well, I think it's true that um, when you distinguish IACs from NIACs, international from non-international armed conflict. Um, again, in international armed conflict, you have enemy combatants who fulfill the four combatant criteria, such as wearing a distinctive sign which is visible at a distance. For a, a normal enemy, that would be wearing his uniform, uh, and that is not so difficult to identify them. In a non-international armed conflict, when you're facing an organized armed group, it is not so easy to identify, well, who is a member of uh, this organized armed group and who is basically taking an active or a direct part in hostilities. That makes it very difficult, especially if they are not wearing a uniform. Now, one of the elements that we use in uh, our, what I would say, this positive identification process in order to identify who we can target, it's basically to emphasize the, the, the pattern of life assessment. We use what we call FMV, full motion video. We have drones mm -hmm. um, that will give us additional uh, visual information on the target, but also on the environment uh, in the vicinity of the target, which will allow us to see uh, or to identify to what extent uh, civilian houses, civilian objects, civilians, IDPs, refugees uh, find themselves in the vicinity of a target. And that will be helpful for us as well in order to distinguish between the innocent civilians and the uh, enemy yes. fighters. Mm -hmm. Restricting the ROEs is another uh, possibility, uh, but again, um, what is uh, certain is that the fact that your enemy is not complying with his obligations in the law of armed conflict doesn't mean that you can disregard your obligations. Of course, so yeah. the threshold yeah, yeah. becomes higher for us, uh, especially with policy and public opinion scrutiny on our military operations, which make it for us also from a policy perspective even more challenging uh, to make sure that we comply uh, even more with our obligations beyond what IHL is asking us. Uh, so you, you feel the pressure of the uh, public opinion, international public opinion. That, that, uh, that's another subject. <laughs> well, but, but there, is, uh, there is this what we call the CNN effect, uh, that basically all your actions are scrutinized 24 hours, 7. Um, and we know how the situation in Afghanistan was. Uh, the enemy is basically abusing and misusing public opinion in order to basically accuse you of murdering civilians, which you didn't do. Uh, but again, uh, it's always a more reactive approach uh, in order to demonstrate that we were not involved in these operations. Mm -hmm. um, and that is also one of the reasons why we need to, to scrutinize all our military actions and to make sure that we complied with each attack with all those uh, major principles of the law of armed conflict. Oh, you so this uh, third question, uh, it's, it's related to a big issue in the conduct of hostilities, is the, the definition, the notion of military objective. This notion has been criticized by some as being too, too broad and by others as too restrictive. So what's, what's, your, what's your opinion on this, this notion? You know that military objective can be targeted. So what's your, your view? Well, I think to have a, a sound understanding of what the military objective is, is crucial to the process because the first step in the process is positively identifying an object as being a legitimate military objective in accordance with the law of armed conflict, which brings us then to the definition of what is a military objective. I think it's fair to say that the definition which is enshrined in Additional Protocol 1 basically reflects customary uh, international law as well. And it's a two-pronged test. Um, all those objects which by use, nature, purpose or location make an effective contribution to military action and whose destruction, partially or totally, gives you basically a military advantage um, when you destroy them. Of course, the difficulty of assessing what is a military objective, uh, that is a difficulty that uh, um, we face uh, specifically in multinational operations. Why? Because other nations are not necessarily bound by the same law, for example, states which are not 
state parties to additional protocol one would disagree with the definition of AP1, who would mm -hmm. not consider that it's customary in nature, mm -hmm. or even allies bound by AP1, but would consider uh, that there is a different interpretation of uh, the military objective. Did we face some issues in relation to the definition? Uh, yes, we did. I mean, in Afghanistan, one of the issues was uh, the question to what extent we could target narco, mm -hmm. narcotic mm -hmm. facilities, because we all know that the profits of the narcotic industry was used to finance the insurgency. So the question was, do we adhere to the more extensive interpretation, which is a US interpretation that war sustaining mm -hmm. efforts, mm -hmm. objects are part of the definition, or do we stick to the, the strict definition mm -hmm. of AP1? And again, we mentioned Syria uh, uh, recently. Uh, well, we have the same question in relation to the conflict in Syria and Iraq. Is the banking system of IS a legitimate military objective? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can we strike all production facilities in Iraq and or Syria because the finance is used to finance the, the activities of IS? I think it's very prudent not uh, to adhere to this very extensive interpretation. Uh, and I, I'm convinced that the definition which is enshrined in Additional Protocol 1 should be interpreted uh, restrictively. That is that effective contribution to military action should, be, should stick to basically what is war fighting capability and not war sustaining capability. Um, and I think that even the, the principle of proportionality uh, could be an additional, um, uh, an additional uh, argument in order to argue that this definition should be uh, construed uh, restrictively. Because again, what is proportionality? It's balancing advanced, uh, it's uh, you're balancing basically your anticipated military advantage direct military advantage. Mm -hmm. um, and what is a direct military advantage? Is it the financing of uh, IS? Uh, is it the banking system? Is it the oil production facility? How would you relate that then uh, to your proportionality analysis? So I think that would be an issue in relation to your identification of what is a military objective. And even if you would accept that, you would still have a problem with your uh, proportionality sure. analysis. Um, so no, I, I, I think we have to stick to the, the strict definition of additional protocol one. Okay, so let's now turn to the, the issue of, of weapons. Uh, we know there are some treaties prohibiting weapons, but there are also general principles, like the, the principle of superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering. There are some, some controversial uh, issues on those principles, at least in, in scholarship. <laughs> Uh, the question is whether those principles uh, can be used to, to prohibit weapons which are not already, already prohibited uh, by a treaty or do we have to wait a treaty or a customary norm prohibiting those uh, new weapons or weapons which are not already prohibited. But what's, what's your, your view on this? Or is it only academic debate? Or uh? Oh, it's far from being an academic uh, okay. debate. I mean, it's a, it's a real uh, issue. Uh, and I would say that the, the first way in which states have to deal with those questions, which are very legitimate questions, so what is the legal framework when basically you assess the legality of the use of a particular weapon system, means or methods of warfare, it's basically the Article 36 Legal Review Commission. Um, Belgium has implemented its Article uh, 36 obligations and every weapon uh, that is produced or where the armed forces wish to acquire the weapon will be subject to this legal review uh, mm -hmm. process. The question becomes then, what are the legal standards you're going to use when you're reviewing the legality of uh, this weapon system? And there, uh, I have to agree with you, there are basically two main, main issues. First of all, you have existing treaties which already limited or prohibited certain weapon systems. And the question becomes then, can that weapon system be integrated in one of those existing treaties? Mm -hmm. In which case, basically, the treaty will give you the answer. Um, if the treaty doesn't give you an answer, well, again, we come back to what are the two cardinal principles which were enunciated by the International Court of Justice in the Nuclear uh, Advisory Opinion case, basically the principle of distinction and the prohibition to inflict unnecessary suffering. Now, in relation to the unnecessary suffering principle, it is true that there is a lot of debate on basically what it means and what it is and what it means in the context of weapons review. I would say that there are basically two uh, two views, there is the functional approach and the utilitarian approach to unnecessary suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer to the question is very difficult. In fact, there is no clear-cut answer. Um, but I think that the, the, the approach that we have um, is as follows. It's basically, well, what is the weapon designed for? Mm 
what is the weapon designed for and if you would use that weapon in its uh, normal uh, way would it cause unnecessary suffering to enemy combatants that would basically mm -hmm. Simplify it, be the, the legal rule that we would use in our legal review commission in order to determine to what extent a weapon would be lawful or unlawful. So basically, that's, th those are the major principles. Uh, in all or certain circumstances, would the use of that weapon in its uh, designated, in its designed way, basically uh, comply with its obligations under distinction, proportionality, precautions, and unnecessary suffering? But we have to agree that there is a lot of uh, fog. Uh, surrounding yes. the principle of uh, unnecessary suffering. Okay, thanks for this, uh, this answer. Uh, so now uh, we're finished with these theoretical questions, uh, but uh, with some practical uh, effects, uh, implications. So now just ab about you, your experience as, as, a, as a legal advisor, because you're a legal, legal advisor to the Belgian uh, forces in, in Syria, the point in Syria. So I would like to, to hear you about your experience. And so my, my first uh, question is about the, the role of IHL in, in, in trenching, influencing uh, uh, states' behavior. So uh, uh, are your advice always followed? Uh, uh, or do the other states feel obliged by IHL? What's your, what's your opinion on this? Well, I've been deployed five times in Afghanistan as a legal advisor uh, during the Libya campaign in 2011 and in 2014 in uh, the framework of uh, that operation as well. I'm very at ease with the way that the Belgian Armed Forces basically implemented their obligation under AP1 as well, which we all know that there is an obligation to incorporate legal advisors within the Armed Forces to advise military commanders. Basically the way we proceed is that we use legal advisors in the two major steps of military operations, which is basically in the planning phase of an operation. So whenever the Belgian government decides to deploy Belgian military forces in a given theater of operation, Basically, there is what we call a GOPG, a Joint Operational Planning Group, which is basically uh, a group of experts that will gather under the supervision of the, the planning uh, officer within the defense uh, planning staff, who will basically um, uh, organize uh, the deployment of uh, Belgian forces. The legal advisor plays, of course, his role during that uh, Joint Operational Planning Group. In what way? Well, first of all, the legal advisor will advise the military commander uh, the Chief of Defence and the Assistant Chief of Staff Operations on the legal framework. So we will determine and we will brief the military commanders on what the, the legal framework of the operation is. Is it an international armed conflict? Is it a non-international armed conflict? What is basically the legal, what are the legal rules that will apply during that operation? Is that important? Yes, that's very important because uh, one of the consequences of that uh, decision will be uh, in relation to two other major issues in the planning phase, namely our rules of engagement. Are we basing those on human rights law, on the law of armed conflict, applicable in international or non-international armed conflict? And then one of the other big issues is of course detention. What are the legal issues in relation to detention? So basically that legal framework which is identified by the legal advisor will determine the legal rules in relation to the use of force and detention issues, which are, of course, as we know, the, the, the major issues for all military operations. When we can hear you, IHL plays a significant role Absol in, 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 in uh, Absolutely. qualification of attacks and detention, and at least for Belgium. Or, I mean. Absolutely. Uh, and that's only in the, the first phase, because again, once the planning, the planning phase ha has been done, we have the execution phase of the operations. Oh, yeah. And in an armed conflict, the Belgian armed forces have also legal advisors deployed with the military commander. So we have in uh, the combined opera air operation center a legal advisor who will assist what we call our red card holder on any, on any decision in relation to targeting. Which means that the red card holder has not only his intelligence folks with him in order to provide him the necessary intelligence surrounding the target, but also his legal advisor mm -hmm. in order to advise him on the legality of the target. Distinction, proportionality, precautions mm -hmm. in attack. Mm -hmm. And that is done for each individual target. Mm -hmm. um, and the aim is, of course, to ensure that we comply with all our obligations under the law of armed conflict. So that's a huge work. <laughs> it's a huge <laughs> for, responsibility. Uh, advisors and a uh, user responsibility. And so just a more uh, personal uh, question. Uh, do you have sometimes maybe some hesitation when giving an advice or is it clear or maybe if it's unclear you, you, you don't give any advice or you give the advice not to carry out the oh. attack or what's even some hesitation sometimes and well hesitation uh, hesitation in the sense of uh, not having the required intelligence 
in order to make that assessment that this is a military objective or that there is a proportionality issue or uh, yes, uh, of course that happens. Uh, but again, we have a golden rule uh, whenever we deploy and that golden rule is in case of doubt, there is no doubt. So if there is any doubt on the identification of a target as being legitimate, yes or no, we don't strike. If we have any doubt in relation to proportionality and precautions, it will be a no strike. I think that's our golden rule and that is probably one of the reasons why at this point in time there are no allegations against the Belgian armed forces in relation to attacking civilians or collateral damage in relation to our operations. And, and your advice as a legal advisor, uh, um, uh, do they carry weight? So do they, are they really followed all the time or uh, is it only part of the, the reflection on, on the, the decision to, take, to carry out the attack? Or, uh, well, uh, I would say there may be some other uh, arguments in order not to allow a strike, but when the legal advisor gives a no-go on a, on a strike, as far as I'm concerned, I was never uh, confronted with a situation and I have no colleagues uh, I'm aware of who were confronted with that situation where basically a military commander said, my legal advisor said it's illegal and I'm going to proceed with the attack. That would be a very bad idea in the first place. <laughs> but that's good but for honestly, you, I've that's never. Good for us. <laughs> I think it's good for uh, anyone. Yeah. Um, uh, it wouldn't be very wise to to disregard your Likewise, legal advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, from a from a theoretical perspective, one could say, well, your legal advice is just an advice, and as a military commander, mm -hmm. I could still take another advice uh, or take another decision, which is true. But in practice, whenever the legal advisor says no, the decision will be a no. Whenever the legal advisors say yes, it doesn't mean necessarily that it's yes, going to be yes as well, because there may be other constraints, operational policy constraints, which may add to the, the legal issues as well. Yes. And we'll finish with a very really, uh, precise uh, question, because you have an experience as a military officer, and we studied in the, in the chapter the notion of perfidy, but we studied that from a very theoretical perspective. So if you have an example in your career, of a kind of perfidy uh, in the sense of action, uh, could you...? Well, I never experienced myself uh, a clear example of perfidy. Uh, but again, uh, one of the most uh, frequent, uh, well, frequent uh, is relative as well, is basically when you have uh, an enemy uh, fighter who would basically feign to have civilian status in order mm -hmm. to, s uh, to surrender himself and then would open fire uh, and basically abuse uh, his so-called uh, civilian immunity uh, to conduct attacks against uh, friendly forces. That would be probably the, the most visible example of what we could face uh, um, in, in uh, relation to perfidy, yes. So many thanks uh, for, for your answers, for your experience, your exp expertise. So, and uh, uh, thanks. Bye. <laughs>